Yes, Ms. Hancock. Uh, my lord, my ladies, I appear um, with my learned friends, Mr. Cutrus, KC, and Mr. Brain, the appellant, the FSCS. My learned friends, Mr. Drake, KC, and Mr. Grant, appear for the respondents, who are long leaseholders in a development in Hume, Manchester, known as New Lawrence House. Yes. This is an appeal against the order of Mr. Dexter Dyer's KC, sitting as a judge of the High Court, dated the 15th of September 2022 whereby the learned judge granted the claimant's application for the judicial review of a decision taken by FSCS on the 6th of May 2021 and quashed that decision. By that decision, FSCS had refused to compensate the respondents for certain unpaid costs and interest, as I shall briefly outline in a moment. Yes. You, you can take it that we've, we've read the papers, we're pretty familiar with them, and you can probably dive pretty much straight into the arguments. Very well. Well, but in, by way of summary, um, the, the appeal, as you know, turns upon a question of construction of certain provisions of the policy protection rules. With the greatest respect to the judge below, we submit that he was not just wrong, but clearly wrong in reaching the conclusion that he did. His analysis was that there, was that there are what he described in paragraph 100 of the judgment um, as two types of claims which are compensable, so-called class one claims and class two claims. Class one claims being claims in relation to liabilities that are, that are protected and thus compensable under the rules, and class two claims being further claims, which uh, he described as being integral to part of, part, part and parcel of, or sufficiently connected to the compensable class one claims, and therefore compensable themselves. We submit that that analysis finds no support in, and indeed is inimical to, inimical to the scheme of the rules. And if right, would be a recipe for uncertainty, doubt, and confusion in the operation of the scheme. It's particularly striking that none of the rules which explain how the compensation calculation is to be carried out by the FSCS cater for Class II claims at all. And we do say that it would be rather surprising that the rules should explain how protected claims, or as the judge called them, Class I claims, are to be calculated and paid, but yet say nothing whatsoever about a whole other class of claims, the so-called class two claims, that on the judge's reasoning apparently exist and fall to be compensated. In our submission, the correct position is simple and clear. Rule 9.1 of the policyholder protection rules, the rules as I shall call them, provide that a protected claim is a claim under a protected contract of insurance. Here, neither of the claims which the respondents seek um, have to, uh, in respect of which the, the respondents seek compensation, name the Judgments Act interest and costs awarded by the court, are claims under the contract. They're claims under the statute uh, and the order of the court. EWIC's liability for those matters um, don't arise under the contract. It follows that the respondents' claim, claims in relation to those matters are not claims under a protected contract of insurance and hence they are not claims that are protected by the scheme. Um, in terms of the factual background, I was proposing just to take you through the chronology very quickly, if that would be helpful. And, and I, I think for myself, I'm, I'm not sure that would be especially helpful unless, no? uh, thank you. In that case, I'll just come straight to the FSCS and the, the scheme. Yes. The starting point is the um, statutory framework. The starting point is the statutory framework, and for that we need to go to section 212 of FISMA, which you'll find in the authorities bundle at tab 9, page 118. This is uh, in the form in which the section was uh, in originally enacted. 2121 provides, provided the authority must establish a body corporate the scheme manager to exercise the functions conferred on the scheme manager by or under this part, and that's a reference to part 15 of the Act. FSES was established by the FSA as the body corporate referred to in subject section 1 to exercise those functions. Um, for completeness, if you go to the next tab, page 181, you'll see that section 2121 has since been amended to refer to um, this 
scheme manager. It says the scheme manager means the body corporate established by the FSA under this section as originally enacted. So that's the FSCS. I'm just noting that. Then if we go please to section 213, which we'll find in tab uh, 11. <coughs> Again, it's originally enacted. The, um, this um, section required the FSA um, by rules uh, to establish a scheme for compensating persons um, in cases where relevant persons are unable or unlikely to be able to satisfy claims against them. Uh, subsection 2, the rules taken together to be known as a financial services compensation scheme. 2133, the scheme, the compensation scheme must, in particular, provide for the scheme manager, A, to assess and pay compensation in accordance with the scheme to claimants in respect of claims made in connection with, and then the relevant name is one, a regulated activity carried on, whether or not with permission, by relevant persons. And just pausing there, in paragraph 9 of their skeleton, the respondents say that section 2133 contemplates that claims will be payable if the claim is made, quotes, in connection with the provision of insurance. So they rely upon that as a sort of foundation for their argument. We submit that that point does not go very far at all for two reasons. First, because 2133A uh, includes the words in accordance with the scheme. Those are limiting words. And secondly, because of section 214, to which I will come shortly, but as you will have seen from your pre-reading, um, that 214 contemplates that limits would, would be put on the nature of claims that will fall within the scheme. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, 2139, if I can just pick that up on page 184. Uh, in this part, relevant person means the person who was A, an authorised person at the time the act or remission giving rise to the claim against him or against his successor falling within subsection, subsection 1b took place or an appointed representative at that time. Now, um, just looking back at 2131, um, just for your, the court's information, the word the regulators, the beginning of the section, that was um, substituted for a reference to the authority um, by the Financial Services Act 2012. And that change reflected the fact that the PRA, the Financial Regulation Authority, assumed responsibility in place of the FCA for contracts of insurance and claims for deposits. So it's now the, poli the PRA's policyholder protection rules and depositor protection rules which deal respectively with claims under contracts of insurance and claims for deposits. And it's the F FCA's compensation scheme rules, on the other hand, which deal with other types of claim, including in particular claims in connection with protected investment business. Now, as we say in paragraph 16 of our skeleton, it's important to note that the purpose of the PPR scheme is not to provide full or complete protection to any policyholder against all losses which they may suffer as a result of an insurer insolvency. The PRA's uh, insurance objective is identified in, in section 2C of FISMA that we have in the authorities bundle at tab 8. <coughs> section 2C subsection 2 provides the PRA's insurance objective is contributing to the securing of an appropriate degree of protection for those who are or may become policyholders. Relatedly, if you take note of section 214 uh, in tab uh, 12, section 2141 provides that the compensation scheme may in particular make provision for various matters. And can I just highlight um, three of them? F. For a claim to be entertained, uh, entertained only if it is made by a specified kind of claimant. G, for a claim to be entertained only if it falls within a specified kind of claim. And J, limiting the amount payable on a claim to a specified maximum amount or a maximum amount calculated in a specified manner. If we could just go over, please, to subsection 2. Um, section further provides that different provision may be made may be made with respect to different kinds of claim. <coughs> and subsection 4, the scheme, or particular provisions of the scheme, may be made so as to apply only in relation to 
A activities carried on, B claimants, C matters arising, or D events occurring in specified territories, areas, or localities. Scheme rules contain various restrictions and limitations upon the circumstances in which compensation is payable. You will have seen some of these referenced in our skeleton. For example, PPR 7, um, which if you, if you want to turn that up, that's at tab 15, page 293. The, the um, version of the uh, PPR yes. was, I think, substituted recently in our bundle so that we've now got it as at July 2021 rather than as at today's date. Um, was there some reason for that, and is there any difference? My, uh, I, I'm not sure why it was thought um, wise to do that. I think it was to show which, which rules contain defined terms. Well, that's right. The original version of this report uh, didn't contain the bold references to the various defined terms throughout the rule. It was to be replaced with a version that did, so that you could readily see which terms were defined and which were not. It wasn't intended to change the date of the application. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check that. Well, the version we have got, I think, is printed on 15th July 2021. Now, so far as mine. One line two says we we the summers had I think been working on the current version with its highlighted and the electronic facility to go through to the definitions. But um, if there is any difference in substance between the wording and what's in the bundle now and the current wording, I think we'd like to be told about that. I don't think there is one. Thank you. Well, I'm working off the original version because these updates were only provided to me yesterday. So if any. Differences appear, it may become apparent if you're looking at the, the new version. Good, thank you. Um, my Lord, sorry. I'm told that the version that has come to you now is the version that was used at first instance. Uh, I think we just want to clarify whether the words have changed yeah. in any <laughs> respect. We should. Thank you. Uh, so I was just. just um, making a broad point that scheme rules contain various restrictions and limitations on, the, on claims that are compensable. And just to give you a few examples, I was going to just show you um, rule seven, which in, in the original version is at page 203 of tab 15. Um, and you will, you will see that that defines eligible claimants and it imposes various restrictions and limitations on who qualifies as an eligible claimant. So it's not everybody who can claim. Uh, then rules 9.2a3 and uh, 9.33 impose restrictions on the types of insurance contracts that are protected. So that, for example, certain types of um, contracts are excluded from the definition of a relevant general insurance contract. <coughs> and on that definition, you go to page 198. Sorry, your references in 9 were to 9.2a. 9.2a, subsection 3. And? And to 9.3. Thank you. Subsection 3. Uh, if one that looks takes, at that, that, the, the reference is taking us back to the definition of relevant. Yes. General insurance contract. Yes, All which right. is on page 198 in, in my version. it excludes various categories of um, insurance, including, for example, credit insurance. And then another limitation, it's the last one I'll take you to uh, at the moment, is in Rule 17.2, should be on page 214 or thereabouts, which imposes a 90% limit. Sorry, just give me that. I was making sorry. a note. Give me that reference again. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, this is... Um, 17.2. 17.2, thank you. 17.2, page 214. And this rule, you will see if one looks at this, um, various claims are identified in rule 17.2, 1, uh, 1A, um, where the level of cover is 100% is of the claim, but then B, in all other cases, the level of cover is 90% of the claim. So one sees that for most types of general insurance contract, the level of cover is 90%, not 100%. That's another example of the limit on the protection that's provided. 
Now, the PRA's assessment of the, quote, appropriate degree of protection takes into account, among other things, the fact that the FSCS is funded by a levy on all participant firms. A balance must therefore be struck between, on the one hand, the degree of protection provided to policyholders, and on the other hand, the need to keep the amount of the levy within appropriate and sustainable limits. And indeed, when considering changes to the, to the rules, the PPR, the PRA ordinarily conducts a cost-benefit analysis of its proposed changes and undertakes a consultation exercise. And just to give you a reference, which I'll come to this document in a moment, so there's no need to turn it up, but for your, for your notes, see paragraph 1.15 of the PRA policy statement PS21, I believe, 20, um, on extending policy holder protection for building protection guarantees, and that's at authorities tab 18, page 303. And I'll show you that document in a moment. And that brings me to this um, obvious point, namely that it was for the PRA, when designing the scheme, to decide upon what it considered to be an appropriate degree of protection. It's clearly not, with respect for this court, to, to second guess the PRA's decision as to what an appropriate degree of protection is. The function of this court is obviously to construe the rules of the scheme in order to identify how they are to be correctly interpreted. Now, the in paragraph 10 of their skeleton, the respondents say that the reference to an appropriate degree of protection in the PRA's insurance objective sheds no light on the issues of construction in hand. But we say, not quite. It sheds light to this extent. The court cannot start with any assumption that the scheme is designed to ensure that policyholders are fully compensated in relation to any loss they may suffer arising out of or in connection with the failure of their insurer. The, the court um, sent the parties an email asking whether there's any case law that supports the application of uh, principles of statutory construction uh, to the PPR. We've not found any authority directly supporting the application of the principles of interpretation of the PPR. But there are cases setting out principles of interpretation to be applied to uh, FCA rules that have been made pursuant to FISMA 2000. And so, those, I mean, presumably those rules are made under similar uh, uh, statutory provisions. Under exactly the same provisions, in fact. The same provisions, yes. thank you. The, um, the policy holder protection rules are made by the PRA pursuant to section 213. Yes. Um, the FCA comp rules are made by the um, FCA pursuant to section 213. The most recent authority um, is a decision of this court that was handed down in April. We've left a copy on your bench. It's the, the, it should be a loose copy. It's not in the file. It's a case the official receiver Shop Direct Finance. Have that. I've got, I've got one. Yes, thank you. It was a new song. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Th this case was concerned with an issue of construction of the DISP rules. That's the dispute resolution uh, rules in the complaints source book. In particular, as to the time limit for referring complaints to the Financial Ombudsman Service, the FOS, in respect of missile PPI. Uh, the DISP rules are made by the FCA pursuant to, to FISMA, and they're found in the FCA handbook. And if um, the court please could turn to paragraphs 44 to 46, you'll see that uh, Lord Justice Singh, with whom a Lady Justice Carr agreed, <coughs> addressed the correct interpretation to uh, the FCA handbook. And perhaps the simplest course would be for me to invite is to read paragraphs 44 to 46. Uh, 46 is the, is the punchline.
submission would be that uh, it would be very surprising if a different approach applied to interpreting the TPR rules as, is, as applies to interpreting the FCA handbook. Therefore, we would invite the board to proceed on the basis of paragraph 46. And that um, brings me to the, the rules themselves. As I've said, they're set out in the PRA rulebook policy for public protection, and they're in tab 15. The rules adopt certain defined terms. Some of those are set out in rule 1.2, and others are set out in the glossary to the PRA rulebook that you have in the next tab, tab 16. Um, we've set out the key rules in our skeleton. I was proposing to take them from there, unless you prefer me to take you to the, the bundle. Well, if you just give us the rules, we can use them either. Very well. The starting point is Rule um, 2.1, which provides that the FSCS must administer the policy public protection scheme in accordance with the rules in this part. The policyholder protection scheme is defined in the glossary, that's tab 16, page 272, as the compensation scheme for claims under contracts of insurance. TPR 3, Rule 3, sets out the qualifying conditions for paying compensation. Rule 3.1 provides that the FSCS may pay compensation to an eligible claimant subject to 18 if it is satisfied that, one, an eligible claimant has made an application for compensation or falls within the category of persons referred to in 3.2, and two, the claim is in respect of a protected claim against a relevant person or where applicable a successor who is in default. Now, protected claim is defined in the glossary, that's tab 16, page 274, as a claim which is covered by the policyholder protection scheme as defined in policy uh, holder protection 9.1. So the definition is actually rule 9.1? Yes. And then we go to 9.1 on page 206, which states that a protected claim is a claim under a protected contract of insurance. The word claim is defined in Rule 1.2, uh, at page uh, 193, as meaning a valid claim made in respect of a civil liability owed by a relevant person, or owed by a relevant person which has been assumed by a successor and which is based on the acts or omissions of the relevant person under a contract of insurance. Um, just pausing there, yes. it, it, EWIC is the successor, I take it, for these purposes, is it? Or, um, because the policies were originally issued by Zurich. That's right, and then there was a part seven yeah. transfer. But yes. And then, um, if I could take you next, please, to rule 17. Uh, page 213 of tab 15. This rule is headed limits on compensation payable. The limits on the maximum compensation sums payable by the FSES for protected claims are set out in 17.2. And then 17.2 provides that for a protected contract of insurance, where the contract is a relevant general insurance contract, and A, if the claim, and then we can jump down to sub 4, is in respect of a liability subject to building guarantee insurance, the level of cover is 100% of the claim, and B, in all other cases, the level of cover is 90% of the claim. And then, in each case, 
cover shall be determined in accordance with 19 and 20, and there is no upper limit on the amount that can be paid. So, as we've just seen, 17.2 then requires us to go to 19 and then 20. Uh, rule 19 provides that the amount of compensation payable to the claimant in respect of a protected claim is the amount of the overall net claim against the relevant person at the qualification date, and any reference in this part to overall claim shall be construed accordingly. 19.1 is, however, subject to the other provisions of this part, in particular those rules that are that set limits on the amount of compensation payable for the protected claim. The limits are set out in 17. And then 19.3, a claimant's overall claim is the sum of protected claims of the same category that he has against a relevant person or a applicable or successor in default, less the amount of any liability which the relevant person or where applicable successor may set off against any of those claims. And then finally, um, 20.2, the FSCS must, um, sorry, headed the compensation calculation, 20.2, the FSCS must calculate the liability of a relevant person or where applicable the successor to the claimant under a relevant general insurance contract in accordance with the terms of the contract and, subject to any limits in 17.21, pay that amount to the claimant. So those are the key rules which arise on the appeal. I wanted to uh, turn now to, to the judgment and just make some short observations in relation to that before moving on um, to my submissions. In, in paragraphs 29 to 39 of our skeleton, we summarise the steps in the judge's reasoning, which led him to what we say is the erroneous conclusion that the respondent's claims for statutory interest and costs are compensable. If one takes the um, judgment, which is in the core bundle at that time, well, at paragraphs 43 to 45, the judge correctly identified the three alternative arguments or grounds relied upon by the respondents to challenge the FSES's decision. Ground one was that the, the respondents' claims for interest and costs were, quote, in respect of a protected claim under PPR 3.12, even if such claims were not themselves protected claims. Ground two was that the respondents' claims for interest and costs are themselves protected claims. And the argument there is that PPR 9.1 provides that a protected claim is a claim, defined term, under a protected contract of insurance, and the respondents say that the effect of inserting the definition of claim into PPR 9.1 is that that rule, on its proper construction, means a valid claim made in respect of a civil liability owed under a protected contract of insurance. And thus, it is said that the valid claim does not itself have to be one under a protected contract of insurance in order to be protected. And then the third ground is that the, resp the respondents say that the claims for interest and costs are claims under the policies and thus are protected claims. Now, at uh, paragraph 56, the judge turned to deal with ground one, but uh, he fell into error uh, almost immediately. He said at 61 that the vital question was what does a valid claim mean? But that question does not arise under ground one. Ground one is concerned with um, rule 3.12. The words valid claim appear in the definition of claim in rule 1.2. But that defined term claim does not appear in rule 3.12. Relatedly, at paragraph 62 of the judgment, the judge said that a decisive question was what the words in respect of mean for the purposes of the definition of claim. But again, that doesn't arise under ground one because ground one is not concerned with the definition of claim. It's concerned with rule 3.12. Moreover, 
At no stage in his, in his analysis of ground one did the judge actually specifically address rule 3.12 at all, even though ground one was squarely based on it. And it also appears from paragraph 118 of the judgment that the judge overlooked the fact that protected claim is defined in the PRA rulebook glossary. So you'll note that um, tab 16, page 274. As we've seen, that's the definition which cross refers back to rule 9.1. Um, moving on to some, of, some other aspects of the judge's reasoning. At paragraph 59, the judge said that he found Hansard of limited assistance. Uh, nobody suggests he was wrong about that. The judge also referred to the PRA's October 2020 policy statement, PS 2120, to which I've already referred. This policy statement was rushed out by the PRA after EWIC had filed for, uh, but before it entered into administration. And the statement brought about a rule change to increase protection for eligible policyholders of building guarantee policies from 90% of any benefit under the policy to 100%. The new rule we've already seen, but for your notes, it's rule 17.24 at authorities 15, page 214. Now, the policy statement, I'd like to just take you to that if I may, in the authorities bundle at tab 18. amendments of policyholder protection part of the PRA rule book. Uh, then under background 1.3, the PRA is responsible for making the rules which govern the operation of the FSCS in relation to deposit takers and insurers. Uh, and insurers. Rules in relation to insurers are contained in the policyholder protection part of the PRA rule book. And then 1.4, policyholder protection 17.21a sets out that protected policyholders are covered for 100% of any benefit under their contract of general insurance. I'll just ask you to note those words, are covered for 100% of any benefit under their contract of general insurance, GI, where the claim is in respect of a liability subject to compulsory insurance, or is in respect of a liability subject to professional indemnity insurance, or is in respect of and arises from the death or incapacity of the policyholder due to injury, sickness, or infirmity. And then 1.5, in all other cases, protected policyholders should receive at least 90% of any benefit under their contract of GI. So pausing there, I ask the court to note the PRA's language of any benefit under their contract. That is entirely consistent with what we say the protection conferred under the scheme is. It's to protect the benefits that are provided under the policy. No more and no less. The respondents' claims for costs and statutory interest are not benefits provided under the policies. Their policies did not provide insurance cover for litigation costs uh, against the insurer or for interest for late payments by the insurer. Moving on, paragraph 1.6 um, sets out what the PA, PRA regards a building guarantee policy to be. It's a contract of general insurance providing building guarantee, construction warranty, and or structural defects cover in relation to newly built, converted, or renovated residential property, including but not limited to the risk of physical damage and or de defect arising from non-compliance with the relevant building or fire regulations or standards. And then could I ask, please, the court, um, one of the most efficient courts, would, would you mind reading to yourselves, please, over the page, paragraphs 1.9, to 
one sees there the rationale for the increase in cover. And then finally, if one looks at 115, there's the point about PRA usually consulting on rule changes that I mentioned earlier. And then at 116, one can see that it was actually the imminent um, uh, prospect of EWIC going into administration which brought about this rule change. The reference to the home of the Book of Business having filed for administration is, as we understand it, a reference to EWIC. Now, the respondents say at paragraph 11 of their skeleton, or they appear to say, that this policy statement and the concern expressed in it by the PRA that the holders of building guarantee policies should be protected up to a level of 100% somehow indicates that FSES's position on this appeal is wrong. But with respect, it does no such thing. The fact that the PRA thought it appropriate that eligible holders of building guarantee policies should be protected to a level of 100% of the benefits under their policies obviously does not mean that the PRA also thought that they should be protected in relation to other losses which they might suffer which were not covered by their policies. In fairness to the judge, he rightly didn't accept the respondent's argument that the policy statement indicated what the respondent suggested before him was a policy on the part of the PRA of, quotes, full compensation. He didn't accept that. And one, if we go back to the judgment and put the authorities under the weight just for a moment, we can come back to it very shortly. But if we just go back to the judgment, at, um, four tab 12, just dealt with this at paragraph 66 to 68. The, the submission recorded by uh, Mr. Drake at the top of one page 20, um, complete protection, and then 67 to 68, you see the judge ultimately at the end of 68 doesn't accept uh, that submission. But then the, the judge does appear at 69 to say that the policy statement casts some light on the purpose of the scheme. Although if one then reads through paragraphs 69 and 70, it doesn't seem that the judge actually did get much from it in that regard. Now, we submit that the policy statement does not provide any support for the respondent's case. On the contrary, the language of, quotes, benefit under their contract, close quotes, in paragraph 1.4 and 1.5, is clearly consistent with FSCS's case. Um, the next aspect of the judge's reasoning that I want to address is his treatment and reliance upon the decisions in the geologistics case at first instance and in the Court of Appeal. Can I take you please to the authorities bundle uh, to tab two? where we have a um, first instance decision of Mr. Justice Davis in Geo Logistics and FSCS. Now, the facts of this case, in summary, were as follows. By Section 1 of the Employers' Liability Compulsory Insurance Act uh, 1969, employers were required to insure against their liability for personal injury to their employees. So they had to take out cover in relation to personal injury um, to their employees. The claimant, a company called Geologistics Limited, took out a composite insurance policy with independent insurance company, which, in addition to the employer's liability cover required by Section 1 of the 1969 Act, also extended to other areas of liability. And it also covered Geologistics for legal expenses for unsuccessfully defending 
personal injury action brought by an employee. So its costs of defending inwards claims uh, by, by injured employees were within the scope of cover. Now, one of Geologistics' employees, a Mr. Frobert, was injured at work and sued, sued Geologistics. During the course of those proceedings, independent insurance, insurer, went into provisional liquidation. And the liquidators approved the continuation of Geologistics' case, i.e., the liquidators approved the company continuing to defend uh, Mr. Frogert's claim. In due course, Mr. Frogert's claim succeeded, and the liquidators just discharged the company's legal expenses incurred after the date of the liquidation. But that obviously left the legal bill which Geologistics had run up prior to the date of liquidation. Geologistics claimed on the FSCS for those costs, the cost that it had incurred in defending Mr. Frogert's claim prior to liquidation date. And the reason the claim was made on the FSCS was because the FSCS was the successor to the Policyholders Protection Board. The question whether the FSCS was liable for those costs depended upon the true construction of Section 6.5 of the Policyholders Protection Act 1975. If I can take you um, to just to a few um, parts of the judge's judgment, we could pick it up. These paragraph four sets out um, section one of the policy the cover provided in relation to employers' liability. One sees that at the bottom of page fifty-two of the bundle. So that was the employers' liability section of the policy, and then you'll see it's not not necessary to absorb the detail, but if you look at paragraphs five and six you'll see that Section 2 was concerned with public liability. Section 3 um, uh, dealt with products liability. So as I've said, it was a composite cover which went beyond just providing the um, cover in relation to injuries to employees. And then um, at paragraph 7, one can see that after those sections, there's then a series of general policy extensions, so-called. And if you could, uh, wouldn't mind reading those uh, one and two to yourself, you'll see that they covered claimants costs and expenses and defence costs. Then I'd invite you to, to, to note um, paragraph 12. The, the judge said three points should be mentioned at this stage. First, the scheme accepts and has never disputed that it is liable to pay the amount of damages awarded to Mr. Proverbs, together with the awarded interest, and further, that it is liable to pay Mr. Proverbs' costs of litigation. So it was conceded by FSCS that um, FSCS was liable to pay Mr. Proverbs' costs of bringing his successful claim. That was within the scope of the scheme. And that concession, as you'll see, we go, go through the judgment, plays um, a not insignificant part in the reasoning of the judge. Uh, we can then go, please, um, over the page to paragraph 14. Section 1 of the 1969 Act is set out. Um, I'll summarise what it says, but there it is. Uh, and then at 15, the judge says it follows, of course, that the claimant was required by statute to ensure against liability for bodily injury or disease sustained by its employees in accordance with Section 1 of the 1969 Act. It can see that the business policy which the claimant in fact took out provided significantly more extensive cover than that required by the 1969 Act itself. Um, uh, and, and, and the judge just uh, elaborates on that a little bit. And then in 16, he says, a few years after the introduction of the 1969 Act, and in the wake of some highly publicised collapses of certain insurance companies, the Policyholders Protection Act 1975 was passed. Uh, the judge then set out the long title, um, which refers to half of that, I think, which matters, an act to make provision for indemnifying, in whole or in part, or otherwise assisting or protecting policyholders and others who have been or may be prejudiced in consequence of the inability of authorised insurance companies carrying on business in the United Kingdom to meet their liabilities under policies issued or securities given by them uh, and for imposing levies on the insurance industry for the purpose. Uh, then the judge just below says this is followed by section one, sets out section one two. I invite um, the court to pass an eye on that. And then 
at 17, the judge said, it is in my judgment clear from those provisions, including the long title, what the policy behind the 1975 Act essentially was. It was to provide a degree of financial protection to those policyholders exposed by the collapse of insurance companies, which are, after all, meant to be authorised regulators. And then at 19, the judge said, of central relevance to the present claim, are subsequent sections of the 1975 Act as amended, and in particular, Section 6. And then you'll see at the bottom of the page, the judge set out Section 6. We're just picking out the relevant parts. 6, compulsory insurance policies and securities. This section applies to any policy which satisfies the requirements of any of the following. That is to say, B, Section 1 of the Employers' Liability and Compulsory Insurance Act 1969. We can then skip to subsection 3. In this section, a liability subject to compulsory insurance means any liability required under any of the enactments mentioned in subsection 1 above to be covered by insurance, or as the case may be, by insurance or by some other provision for securing its discharge. 4, subject to Sections 9, 13, and 14 below, and the following provisions of this section, it shall be the duty of the Board to secure that a sum equal to the full amount of any liability of a company in liquidation towards any policyholder or security holder under the terms of any policy or security to which this section applies is paid to the policyholder or security holder as soon as reasonably practical after the beginning of the liquidation. And then 5, subsection 4 above does not apply by reference to any liability of a company in liquidation under the terms of a policy to which this section applies arising otherwise than in respect of a liability of the policyholder which is a liability subject to compulsory insurance. If we then go on, please, to paragraph 23 of the judgment, the judge observed that in section 6.4, protection is given in wide terms to the generality of policyholders, albeit, as subsection 4 is expressly to state, subject to the provisions there identified. One of those provisions is subsection 5. That clearly operates to delimit the prima facie width of subsection 4 by providing that it does not apply, and then one sees the words created from section 5, subsection 5, I've just read out. If that delimitation applies, then subsection 6 takes effect in the case of a private policyholder. The drafting technique of first setting out a wide provision and then qualifying it by a limiting provision was and is, in fact, quite a common one, and I don't myself think that any great significance attaches to the use of that technique in this statute. We'll see that when we get to the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Waller took a slightly different approach in relation to that, but we'll come on to that in a moment. And then, just below paragraph 27 on page 61 of the bundle, the judge turned to the submissions, and if I can just pick it up at the top of page 62, the judge said the essential exercise here is to assess the true meaning and effect of subsection 6.5. Just below C on that page in paragraph 29, or three lines below C, the judge said that, in my view, the purpose of section 6.5, consistently with the overall purpose of the 1975 Act, is not directed at safeguarding the third-party victim. Rather, it is directed at protecting those policyholders who have been compelled by Parliament to take out at their own expense the applicable insurance. And then 30, that being so, and in my view it is so, the crux of this case lies in the words in respect of, as used in section 6.5 of the 1975 Act. Mr. Edelman, whilst rightly acknowledging that such words have to be interpreted in the light of the particular statutory context in which they are found, submitted that the words in respect of, in their ordinary and natural meaning, connote some connection between two subject matters. In this context, he cited to me the decision of Justice Borum in Passam and Chadwick, and then if you just jump down three lines, in the course of his judgment, Mr. Justice Borum referred to some observations of Chief Justice Mann in the Australian case of trustees, executives, and agency company, and rightly. If we go then to the top of page 63 of the bundle, picking it up in the second line from the quotation from Mr. Justice Borum's judgment, he said this, in the course of giving his judgment, Chief Justice Mann attempts this explanation of the words in respect of, at page 111, the words in respect of are difficult of definition, 
but they have the widest possible meaning of any expression intended to convey some connection or relation between the two subject matters to which the order refers. And at 32, you see Mr. Justice Davis um, knowledge that although Riley's case was different, he nevertheless gained assistance from those general observations, if only because they seemed to him to properly reflect what the wisdom was. <coughs> Uh, do ordinarily convey. And then one sees these submissions, if, if I just invite the court just to um, read 33 and 34. see that um, some um, forensic emphasis was placed on the concession that was made by the FSS in relation to Mr. Frolic's cut. Uh, and as the judge, the, the judge uh, says at 35 that he confessed he could see no convincing answer to um, the geologistics submissions. And in 37, just above D, the judge observed that one line that could be drawn is by confining full policy protection solely to those liabilities for which a policyholder is statutorily compelled to insure, but the scheme, by its concession, that it is liable for third, third parties' claimants' costs, disclaims that. So there was a narrow reading of potentially available of this section, but because FSCS was conceding <coughs> that the claimants' costs fell in the scope of the scheme, that interpretation was not available. And then the judge went on at 38 to say, in my view, however, the suggestion that the victim's costs are sufficiently connected to the liability to be within the phrase in respect of, but the unsuccessful defender's costs are not sufficiently so connected is unconvincing. But there again is the sort of concession coming back to bite the FSCS, if you like. That's the first four lines of paragraph 38. And then uh, the last four lines of 38. As it seems to me, these defence costs can be said to relate to and be connected with a liability required by the specified statute to be covered by insurance, such that they are within the ambit of the phrase in respect of in section 6.5 on a fair and natural reading of the subsection. Uh, and then, um, just coming towards the end of what I need to show you, paragraph 40. The reason I accept Mr. Edelman's submissions on this is essentially because, in my judgment, they rightly acknowledge that the exclusion, otherwise than in respect of a liability of the policyholder, which is a liability which is subject to compulsory insurance, is not simply to, disp to be disposed of as a matter of definition. It's also a matter of degree. That is, by reference to the terms of the particular policy in question, regard must be had to the circumstances of each case to assess whether the degree of connection is shown to be sufficient to bring the liability within or as the case may be out with section 6.5. I accordingly think that on this natural law reading meaning, section 6.5 extends full protection to the claimant for its costs of unsuccessfully defending Mr. Roberts' claim. Those costs are, in, in my view, par, in effect part and parcel of that claim, and are part and parcel of, and integrally linked to, the liability for which insurance cover was required under section 1 of the 1969 Act, and are within the reach of what was required to be recovered from uh, the under section 6.5. And then the judge went on to say that that conclusion um, was also found support from other matters, uh, first of which he said he thought it was fair. Uh, and then um, 45, just for completeness, the judge said that he thought the concession which had been made by FSCS was rightly made. Just to make, sure, just to make you aware of that. So that's that's geologistics at um, first instance. I'm going to take you now to the Court of Appeal judgment, and then I'll come back and make my submissions as to what the court gets from these two judgments. So the Court of Appeal judgment is in the next tab. Um, and we can pick it up with in the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Waller at six. 
said that the judge was on the view that the object of the 1975 Act was to provide a degree of protection for policyholders, and that Section 6 was to provide protection to corporate policyholders because they had been compelled to insure. To Sidney Kentridge, as Mr. Phillips, who was now, I should say, was now um, representing FSCS, Sidney Kentridge, as Mr. Phillips had done in the court below, challenged the judge's view as to the object of the 1975 Act, and in particular Section 6 of that Act. Reliance was placed on the long title and on the reference to the Act protecting policyholders and others. So it was submitted that the primary purpose of Section 6 was to protect the third parties who were intended to be beneficiaries of the compulsory insurance referred to in that section. Why, Sir Sidney submitted, should there be an exception to the general rule, the corporate policyholder should not recover unless it was to protect the third parties in favour of whom the compulsory insurance was required to be taken out. The answer seems to me to be, first, that the 1975 Act as a whole is clearly, by provisions such as Section A2, concerned with protecting policyholders, albeit in that context private policyholders, and only to the extent of 90%. The language of Section A2 and 6.4 is the same, save for the fact the indemnity is 100%, and corporate policyholders are now included. Furthermore, the fact that corporate bodies are included and that the extent of the indemnity is increased to 100% is consistent with the notion that, because insurers have been forced to take out insurance and pay premiums, therefore, if insurance companies become insolvent, all policyholders ought to be protected completely. Obviously, there's a benefit to the third party victims as well, and that Parliament may also have had in mind. The critical point is that Sir Sidney wished to use the argument that the object was to protect third party victims so as to construe, se construe Section 6.4 and 6.5 as if its sole or at least primary purpose was to assist victims as opposed to indemnifying policyholders. In my view, that is not a legitimate construction of the statute. So that, that sort of um, set the, um, the sort of, uh, that was an overarching point dealing with the way FSCS was seeking to present their case on the appeal. And then um, at 11, well, Justice Waller observes that the correct approach to the sections is um, he was attracted to Mr. Evans' submission, but the language of the subsections must be the starting point, and he then set them out. And then at 12, he says this, subsection 5 is certainly capable of a very narrow construction. That construction, which was essentially that put forward by Sir Sidney, involves saying that the liability of the insurance company, to which subsection 4 would apply on its natural language, is to be construed as not encompassing any liability other than an established liability of a policyholder which he is obliged to have compulsorily insured. So Sidney support to support this narrow construction by reference to certain authorities. He argued that the authority relied on by the judge dealing with the words in respect of advocated too wide an interpretation of those words, and that those other authorities demonstrated that, it, that a narrower construction was apposite. So one can see, that, again, the, the judge is noting, as has been noted at first instance, that it, one possible reading is to read the, the cover very narrowly to simply um, relate to uh, um, liabilities that, in respect of which um, insurance was compulsory. And then at uh, 15, um, the judge turns to the authorities um, uh, which Sidney cited. Uh, it's not necessary, I think, to um, spend any time on them, save to note um, that there were authorities which read in respect of much more narrowly. And then at 17, Buddhists will have said this, I do not get much assistance from the authorities. They simply demonstrate that the proper construction of the words will depend on their context. And that is, a, we say, right, and that will be part of my submissions when I come to deal with what we say you take, the court should take from these cases. And there's then reference to the concession, again, a paragraph 19, that had been made at first instance. Um, so the difficulty was that FSCS were accepting that they were liable to pay Mr. Fogarty's costs as a claim. And that then led Sydney at 20 to, to seek to persuade the court that an obligation to pay the claimant's cost was something against which the logistics was required to ensure. So he was trying to argue that um, FSCS was uh, the geologistics were required to insure against their liability for the cost of a successful claimant. And therefore, that would explain why FSCS was conceding that those costs were covered by the scheme. Um, the arguments are then canvassed through 20 to 23. Um, 
sorry, 20 to 22, but it's fair to say that um, the court was not persuaded by that argument. And then at 23, the, the law disorder said that in any event, it seems to me that a narrow construction placed on section 65 by system is inconsistent with there being the two subsections. If section 6, 4, and 5 were intended to provide an indemnity against only that which was required to be the subject of compulsory insurance, section 6, 4 could have so provided without the need for section 6, 5. That alone supports the view that the words otherwise than in respect to the liability of the policyholder, which is a liability subject to compulsory insurance, must be intended to produce the result that what the policyholder can recover under section 6, 4 goes beyond the liability which must be compulsory insured. What is contemplated is therefore that under a policy which is required to be taken out, the policyholder will be entitled to recover against the insurance company some indemnity beyond that for which the statute provides insurance. But by virtue of section 6.5, that right to indemnity must still be in respect of a liability subject to um, compulsory insurance. And the judge then, uh, well, just, well, then went, um, went back to the policy, he set out the um, uh, the, the extensions in relation to claimants' costs and expenses and defence costs. And then at 25, he said the policyholder thus has an indemnity covering costs recovered by any claim in connection with any claim to which the indemnity applied. If the insurance company became insolvent, the question under Section 6.5 would be whether those costs were incurred in respect of the liability which is subject to compulsory insurance. The answer to my mind is yes, because the words liability subject to compulsory insurance are descriptive of the type of liability covered by the policy and not intended to describe an act of established liability, and in respect of is in context intended to mean, or at least to include, in connection with. And then, um, could I just ask the court um, just to read 26 to 29, please? The question arises, what, what does this court get from the geologistics decisions? Uh, in our submission, the answer is very little. The first point is that the court was construing a very different instrument. There, the court was construing the Policyholders Protection Act, in particular, section 6.5, when read together with section 6.4. The structure of section 6 of the Act with the interrelationship between section 6.5 and 6.4, on which Lord Justice Waller commented, you saw a moment ago, is not, is not replicated in the protection rules. Indeed, the scheme, small s, of the, of the rules is very different to that of the 1975 Act. Most obviously, the 1975 Act contained no equivalent of rules 17, 18, and 20 of the scheme, which dictate how compensation is to be calculated and paid. Obviously, the differences between the Act and the rules go, beyond, go far beyond that, but that is a very obvious difference. The second point is that, as Lord Justice Waller rightly said at paragraph 17 of his judgment, the proper construction of words will depend on their context. Just as Lord Justice Waller got little assistance from the previous authorities that were cited to him, 
we submit that this court also gains little assistance from the previous authorities being cited to it by the respondents, namely geologistics. It's all a question of the particular context in which the words appear. Third, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that geologistics costs of defending Mr. Froggart's claim were insured under the policy. The question in that case was which insured liabilities were protected under the 1975 Act. Here, by contrast, the interests and costs which are the subject of the respondents' claims against FFCS are not insured under their policies. Do you accept that if this policy had actually said um, that, that the insurer would indemnify uh, against the, the costs, would, would make good interest, you'd be in more difficulty? Yes. Because subject to construing the provisions of the policy, if, if, if cover was provided on a true construction of the terms, then there would be a claim under the policy. Policy, exactly. Yeah. So that, that's, that's the real distinction, isn't it, between this case and you? Forget, forget the different statute, but essentially, um, geologistics, it was a claim under the policy, and it was just a question of the narrowing uh, words of subsection 5. Exactly that. Can I ask a related question to make sure I've understood yes. that, how that works under the current rules? Because there are parts of the rules, in particular, I think Rule 17, which uses the phraseology in respect to the liability subject to compulsory insurance, which isn't dissimilar um, from what's considered in geologistics. Ge um, is, is the position of the FC, S, FC, uh, FSCS that um, those sorts of costs if covered by a policy would be uh, under today's scheme covered by the scheme. Sorry, mate, can I just clarify? So if, I, if you look at, say, Rule 17.2, yes. um, which provides for a 100% cover for claims in respect to the liability subject to compulsory insurance, Yes. That, if you had the facts of that case now, um, you'd be looking at that wording, would you? Well, to determine whether there was one hundred percent. You'd be looking in part of that. You'd also be looking at twenty point two. So the way we say the scheme is intended to work is well, you'd be looking at twenty point one actually. which has another in respect of reference. Yeah, our, our position mm. is that what, what, the scheme is, what the scheme is intended to do is to protect policyholders where they take it, where they're ineligible claimants and it's a relevant type mm. of insurance. I think those conditions as read. Um, the purpose of the scheme is, is that if you, if you take out an insurance policy, and your insurer is unable to pay your claim because they go into default, be that of administration or whatever, then your claims under the policy will be are protected by the FSCS. So it comes down to whether what you are claiming is a claim under the terms of your policy. And what the scheme doesn't do is provide wider um, cover. Yes, that's your protected claim. Yes. Point. Yes. I think, therefore, that the answer to my lady's question has to be that ge geologistics would be decided the same way under the current rules because um, the, if the policy, um, of co which was compulsory insurance policy, included a provision um, which gave rise to a liability to pay costs to the other side, that would be covered by um, 
17.211A1 little 1. Yeah, because you, you, you yeah. say it would be a protected claim. Yeah. Exactly. And you wouldn't be in the territory that the judge was in in this case, of distinguishing between protected claims and some other class in respect of exactly. protected claims. It would simply be a protected claim. Yes. We do say that if, if just, just to finish the point on geologistics, if, if the court in geologistics, geologistics had been asked whether the words in respect of in section 6.5 of the Act covered the cost of pursuing the insurer, the answer to that would clearly have been no. Not least because section 6.4 of the Act was limited to liabilities under the terms of the policy. Now, um, if I, we can you go back to the judge's judgment below, <coughs> core tab 12. The judge addressed the decisions in geologistics at paragraphs 72 to 93 of his judgment. It is, I think, fair to say that the judge um, seems to have struggled to extract much from the two decisions that assisted him. But he did say, if you look at paragraph 91 on page 132, that the decision provided some, quote, residual persuasive force. And that seems to have been the launch pad for the judge's class one and class two claims distinction in paragraph 100 of the judgment and following. We respectfully submit that the geologistics decisions do not provide any sand or reliable basis for the judge's class one and class two claims analysis. Rather, the words in respect of, in rule 3.12, fall to be construed in their own context within the scheme of the PPR as a whole. The respondents, on the other hand, in their skeleton at 26 say, that the judge was right to rely on geologistics, but that he underplayed its significance in the present context. They say that when using the words in respect of, in rule 3.12, the FSCS must be taken to have intended that the phrase would bear the meaning that was attributed to it in geologistics. Now, leaving aside that it's, it's the, the relevant intention here is that of the PRA, not the FSCS, because the rules of the PRA's rules not the FSCS's rules. The short answer to that submission is that the whole scheme of the PPR is very different to that <laughs> under the 1975 Act, and that, one, one, and, and that when one has regard to the scheme of the PPR, including rules 17, 18, and 20, it is plain that the words in respect of, in rule 312, are intended to mean for or for payment of. And that is also the answer to the respondent's attempt to rely at paragraphs 19 to 21 and 35 of their skeleton on the Barras principle. And I just quickly deal with that by reference to an extract from Benyon that we have in the authorities bundle at tab 17. Tab 17, page 294, paragraph 24.6, deals with the Barras principle. Where an act uses a word or phrase that has been the subject of previous judicial interpretation in the same or a similar context, it may be possible to infer that the legislature intended the word or phrase to bear the same meaning as it had in that context. This is sometimes known as the Barras principle. This is, at most, a presumption, the strength of which will vary according to the context. There is no rigid rule that words must be given the same meaning that they have been given in an earlier act. The question in the end is always whether the legislature intended the term to be given the meaning it has been given um, previously. Um, and then under comments, one can see four lines into the first paragraph. 
Um, the observation that previous judicial interpretation should be viewed as no more than a starting point. And then at 295, second complete paragraph, no matter how the principle is characterised, it is clear that there is no rigid rule that words in an act must be given the same construction as the courts have previously given words in another act. Varying weight will be given to previous judicial interpretation, depending on the context of each particular case. As Lord Hoffman said in uh, A and 4, the value of such previous interpretations as a guide to construction will vary with the circumstance. And then we can pick it up just below the example paragraph. There is also some indication that the courts may be more inclined to rely on a previous judicial interpretation in cases where, following the enactment of the legislation in question, the legislature has built on the legislative scheme and has taken no steps to reverse the earlier judicial decision. While later legislation is sometimes used as a buttress of arguments in maintaining an earlier interpretation, the notion of drawing inferences from legislative inaction is problematic for the reasons given in those section 24 and 20. Where different wording is used, or the same wording is used in a different context, the courts are less likely to find an argument based on previous judicial interpretation persuasive. For this reason, previous judicial interpretations are likely to be particularly relevant where the previous interpretation relates to an act in pari materia. So that's all I think we need from uh, Benjamin. Our submission is that although the broad context of the PPR and the 1975 Act can be said to be similar, the protection of policyholders, the particular context in which the words in respect of are used is very different. As I've said, the scheme of the rules is very different to the scheme of the Act. Therefore, there is no uh, room for operation of the Barras principle in the way in which the respondents seek to deploy it. Uh, finally, on geologistics, just um, again for the court to note that um, my learned friends in their skeleton, paragraph 31, summarise Mr. Davis's reasoning, but they omit to mention, make any mention whatsoever of the concession made by FSCS. Uh, in that case, in relation to Mr. Froggatt's costs being covered. And that omission is, for reasons which I'm sure will be apparent, is something of a shortcoming, we say, in their summary of the decision. So um, <coughs> I can now come quite shortly to my submissions uh, in relation to uh, round one. Can I, sorry, can I just divert you for a moment? Yes. <laughs> just try and clear something out of my yes. head. It arises out of 17.2. Um, and what I'm wondering is whether, for this purpose, we should be focusing not on the words in respect of, but the words subject to. Yes. The, the, this is, of course, for the purposes of categorising those that are 100% and those that are 90%. Yes. But if one looks in A, it's if the claim, now that's claim defined term, so that, that, that means the claim against the insurer, not the claim on the compensation, compensation scheme. Uh, so the claim on the insurer is, if we take the first one, in respect of a liability subject to compulsory insurance. So obviously the claim on the insurer has to be in respect of a liability. But the liability has to be subject to compulsory insurance. Yes. So the liability subject to compulsory insurance uh, is itself defined, uh, but um, in the definition means, page 195, uh, basically, a liability which has to be compulsorily insured, yeah. uh, and therefore, a for sure, uh, a, a liability under the contract of insurance. Yes. So we are looking, are we, for the purposes of 17.2, at the words in respect of, uh, to see whether here they mean for, as you would say, or some wider connected with uh, a 
and it's the same question we have to ask under 17.2 as we have to ask under 3.12. I think that's right. Well, that was behind my question, whether yes, it right. is the same, because if you do say that geologistics would be decided in the same way, does it follow that you're giving in respect of a different meaning? In, on your submissions, between Rule 3 and Rule 17? Because, yeah, because the type of liability subject to compulsory insurance is, in context, a liability under Section 1 of the 1969 Act. So, I think you're giving it the same meaning. If you go back to 3.12, the wording is, claim is in respect of a protected claim. Yes. I think you'd say, taking that into 1A1, liability subject to compulsory insurance is the same for these purposes as protected claim, and it's in respect of meaning for, in both senses. I don't think so, because the liability subject to compulsory insurance is the underlying liability. The protected claim is the claim against the insurer. It's different things. Put it another way, the costs in geologistics are not, assuming the 1969 Act hasn't changed, are not themselves compulsorily insured. So, I think the answer, maybe to your question, is that the costs would come under 17.2.1.1.2. It's 90% cover. Okay, I see. So, right. I see. Under today's scheme, the answer would be 90% protected. So, it would still be a claim under a protected contract of insurance, but that element of it would not be in respect of a liability subject to compulsory insurance, you say? Yes. It would be, but it would still be covered because it's part of the policy. Yes. And so, you say you get 90%. Yes. Okay. So, just to take our submissions on ground one, and I'm going to just go back just to our skeleton, the rules set out in paragraphs 21 and following, but you may prefer to follow in the rules themselves. The starting point is rule 2.1. The FSCS must administer the policyholder protection scheme in accordance with the rules in this part. Policyholder protection scheme is defined as the compensation scheme for claims under contracts of insurance. We say the word under means what it says. This scheme is concerned with claims under contracts of insurance. PPR 3 then sets out the qualifying conditions for paying compensation. The claim must be in respect of a protected claim. That's rule 3.12. The claim is in respect of a protected claim. And the definition of protected claim, as we saw earlier in the glossary, cross refers to rule 9.1, which states that a protected claim is a claim under a protected contract of insurance. And the word claim in that definition, the word claim that appears in rule 9.1, 
is itself defined in Rule 1.2 and again incorporates the concept of a civil liability owed under a contract of insurance. So the repeated use of the word under in these provisions in our submission leads to the conclusion that even at this stage of the analysis, the scheme is concerned with protecting benefits under contracts of insurance. And we do say the matter is put beyond all doubt by Rules 17, 19 and 20. Rule 17, we set out in paragraph 25 of our skeleton, sets out the limits on the maximum sums payable by FSCS for protected claims. And in the case of building guarantee policies, that limit is 100% of the claim. But on the judge's analysis, there are two claims, that, uh, two categories of claims that are covered. Protected claims, which are subject to the limit in 17.1, which are his class two claims, class one claims. And then other claims, his so-called class two claims, which are not themselves protected claims, but are sufficiently closely connected to class one claims to attract cover. But those claims are not subject to any limits at all. In be, indeed, Rule 17.1 and 17.2 do not even acknowledge their existence. And we say that just simply cannot be right. A carefully drawn scheme like this, it's inconceivable that um, there would be a, a, a gap of that um, magnitude in, in the rule. If these other claims were intended to be covered, they would have been addressed in this part of the rules, dealing with the limits upon and calculation of the compensation that is payable but they are not. And the judge's attempt to grapple with this point at paragraph 120 of the judgment respectfully will not do. He went back to the defined term claim, which does not arise under ground one. Um, next, we go to rule 19.1, uh, which we um, uh, address in paragraph 27 of our skeleton we set about their convenience. 19.1 provides that the amount of compensation payable in respect of a protected claim is the uh, amount of the overall net claim <coughs> against the relevant person at the contemplation <coughs> date. Now, if the judge was right, and his second class of claims, claims in respect of a protected claim, exists, 19.1 expressly provides that the amount of compensation payable for such class two claims is limited to the overall net claim. So to, just, to, just to be clear, quite dense, the, um, I'm, I'm focusing on the use of the words in respect of in rule 19.1. Those are the words which the judge reads as giving rise to or um, providing room for these class two claims. If you read it that way, and what 19.1 does is says that the limit on the amount of compensation payable for those class two claims, as well as the class one claims, the total payment you get is limited to the overall net claim. And then when you go to 19.3, it's clear that the overall net claim is the sum of the protected claims. So just putting that all together, The effect of that is that the amount of the compensation payable in respect of a protected claim is the sum of the protected claims. Uh, it's a very small point. I can't see what the word net does in no. do my point off in one. Well, it's not when you read 19.3, because that provides for this. I agree, it's okay. a slight it's a slight Okay, but it, it's not in you're, you're not saying it's intended to catch anything else that we should be aware of? Nothing, nothing turns on it. I, right, but I, okay. I, I really take um, Lily's point. Yeah, because 19.3 um, expressly addresses that. By limiting the amount payable in respect of a protected claim to the sum of the protected claims, it must follow that in respect of a protected claim in 
three, rule 321 means for or for payment of when it's driven to that conclusion. So you get the overall net claim is not a defined term. I don't believe it is. But we'll check that. Well, I, would, I would have thought that either the word net is missing from 19.3 or it's intended to just tie up with 19.3, which explains what a net, net what the netting off is. I, I respectfully agree. It's obviously yeah. intended to be um, your, to the policyholder's claims, net of any monies due the other way. Well, the idea is that you don't get any more than the total that you could have got back from the insurer under the policy, or policies. subject to the 90% if there's a percentage. And then the final point is that uh, under Rule 20.2, this instructs, we set this out in paragraph 28 of our skeleton, this instructs FSCS to pay the amount due in accordance with the terms of the contract, subject to any limits in 17.2.1. The judge sought to grapple with this at paragraph 122 of his judgment. But with respect, that's a very difficult paragraph to follow. If the judge's class two claims exist, we say that rule 20.2 would not be written as it is. It simply would not be written requiring FSCS to pay um, the amount due in accordance with the terms of the contract. And it's mandatory. In paragraph 53 of our skeleton, we identify two further rules, rules 18.2 and 19.9, which we submit further undermine the judge's analysis. I've nothing to add to what we say in those paragraphs <coughs> of the skeleton, but just to make clear that we do rely on them. And uh, also at paragraph 56.3 of our skeleton, we also identify some further rules which tie in with, and we say support our case, that the words in respect of in rule 3.12 mean for or for payment of. And again, we rely on those rules, but I'm going to propose to say anything more about them now. Or which paragraph? 56.3 Thank you. of our skeleton. Um, one final point I need to address on ground one is that set out in paragraph 39 of the respondent's skeleton. They suggest there that where an insurer becomes insolvent and there is a dispute as to the indemnity payable under the policy, so insurer goes bust, insured has a, has a dispute with the insurer as to what the scope of the cover is, they say, if we're right, the, in, the insured would have no practical way of challenging the insurer's position because they say they'd have to litigate against the insurer, the cost of doing so wouldn't be picked up by the scheme and that's therefore um, leaves them in, a, in, in some sort of black hole. Mm. That is a bad point. In the scenario that the, that's being contemplated, insurer goes bust, dispute between the insured and insurer for the scope of the cover. Once the insurer is, is declared in default by FSCS, FSCS would then, is then required under the rules to calculate the insured's entitlement under the terms of the policy and pay that sum to the insured. That's what Rule 20.2 says, subject to the limits in 17.21. And if the insured thought that FSCS had misconstrued the policy and was paying them too little under the scheme, the insured could challenge the FSCS's decision by judicial review and, if successful, could seek a cost order against the FSCS. So the problem that they identify in paragraph 39 simply doesn't arise. Does that mean that the FSCS would have to take on itself the mantle of determining the dispute between the insurer and the assured? The FSCS is required to apply the terms of the policy. Yes, but, it, um, but the dispute is whether the policy covers it. So you've got an underlying dispute as to whether or not this person is actually insured for the whatever it may be under the terms of the policy. And that's raging. And then the insurer goes bust. Um, 
you say, well, that's all right, there's a safety net because the FCS, uh, uh, FSCS has to calculate <coughs> the amount due under the policy, but there may, may be nothing due under the policy. Yes. So are you saying that the FSCS has to take upon itself um, the legal the, the the determination of the legal dispute between the insurer and the insurer? No, it doesn't doesn't get involved in it. I mean, if there are ongoing litigation between the insurer and the insurer, the FSCS doesn't have to intervene in that. The FSCS is simply required to apply the rules. So a claim would be made on the FSCS by the insured. The insured would say, I'm, I've, I've got a claim on my policy which hasn't been met. My insurer is in default. I'm now claiming under the scheme. So the FSCS would assume that the policy applied? No, it would take its own advice because it, it's required it, um, it's required to take its own view. There is a rule which is relevant to this, which I should just quickly show you. It's in it's rule 19.4. I'm just not sure from what you're telling me that the black hole doesn't exist. Mm. I think it but may depend at what point the insurer goes, bust. insurer goes bust, at what point in the potential dispute. If, if this insurer had gone bust at a much earlier stage, Presumably, it may be that the FSCS would have to determine for itself. Yes, exactly. What, if any, amount was due. Yes. But in fact, this insurer went bust much later in the process. Yes. It's part of the potential difficulty. Yes, and and by that stage, there was a decision of this court. Yes. Uh, as to the scope of the cover. The rule I was going to show you, which is relevant, is Rule 19.4, mm. which says, uh, this, is, so this is Authorities 15, page 215, which says that in calculating the claims overall claim, the FSCS may rely, to the extent it is relevant, on any determination by Court of Competent Jurisdiction, uh, liquidator, etc. So if there's obviously, if there's a finding, if there's a decision of the court, if matters have, re have um, reached that stage, then one would expect FSCS to apply the court's decision, unless there was some very good reason, which is hard to, to think what that could be. But the simple point is that um, once the insurer is in default, a claim is made on the FSCS, the obligation is then on an FSCS to pay what is due under the policy. And if it's suggested that its decision has um, got that wrong, that it's mis misapplied or misconstrued the policy, then the remedy of the insured is to judici judicially review the FSCS. Well, JR isn't much use in that context. Um, if, uh, if the FSCS has taken a decision which is rational, May nevertheless be wrong as a matter of law, um, because it may it may determine that nothing is payable under the policy because it takes the view on advice that the um, assured is in breach of warranty uh, and that there is nothing due under the policy. It may turn out to be completely wrong about that, um, but JR is not going to give it very much comfort. Well, the question for FSCS, it wouldn't be a question of, I mean, it wouldn't be a rationality standard in that context. The question would be, what do the terms of the policy require the FSCS to pay out? It's a legal question, a question of construction of the policy. Well, you, because the rules require the amount to be paid, so it wouldn't with, be a rational In accordance with the terms of the policy. Yes. But if that's right, it's still the case that the position on cost could yes. differ very significantly depending on who the policyholders were having any fight with. And when? The, um, the, the point that I'm meeting is, mm. is, the, is, the, is the suggestion in their skeleton that they would have no means of um, determining the, uh, their rights under the policy um, in a way where they can be protected on costs. And my submission is that's not right because um, obviously what happens as between the insured and the insurer before the insurer goes into default, they are at risk as all litigants are in relation to costs at that stage. 
But once, if, if no court determination has been reached by the point when the, the dispute is ongoing, on, um, the insurer then goes uh, bust into administration, declared in default. The um, way the scheme is then intended to work is the insured then claims on the FSCS, says I had a claim under my policy which has not been met. I'm covered under the scheme. You should now pay me what's due. The scheme rules then require FSCS to take the policy and to pay the insured what they're entitled to in accordance with the terms of the contract. They, dis they make a decision which they notify the insured of as to how much they're proposing to pay and how they've arrived at that conclusion. If the insured wishes to say, you know, you've got that wrong, my, my entitlement is greater than that, then they are able to challenge the FSCS. And if the FSCS has got that wrong, A, they will get a ruling from the court quashing the decision and requiring FSCS to take it again. And B, in the ordinary course, they would expect to get their costs against the FSCS of that challenge. So there is some form of remedy, but it may not be perfect, I think, is the answer. Because I'm still far from convinced that judicial review is the appropriate medium in which to test questions of insurance law, particularly factual issues, dispute as to whether or not an assured is covered under an insurance policy. But you say, well, it's better than uh, the black hole that's been painted. It may be slightly less black and slightly less deep. But there, are, there are other rules as well, which, I mean, the FSCS doesn't necessarily, um, slightly moving off point, but the FSCS also has the ability to put in place alternative insurance arrangements. That's another thing it can do. It can arrange alternative costs as another option under the rules. So the scheme is not just about paying claims. So that might provide another way through. Um, that's all I wanted to say on ground one. Now, grounds two and three are the subject of a respondent's notice. Um, my submissions on grounds two and three are very short and actually repeat some of the same points I've made on grounds one. I'm in the court's hands as to whether you'd like me just to finish or whether you'd like me to um, make my submissions. Well, I think perhaps the, um, the proper course would, would be you to respond to what Mr. Blake has to say on those. Very well. Ladies, I can be, I think, relatively short, given the uh, coverage that my learned friend has uh, achieved over this morning. Can I start with the question of statutory interpretation that came up in the very first call? Uh, the, the judge obviously dealt with canons of construction. I think the court will be aware of that. Can we, how the judge? So that's at um, paragraph 37 following the judgment, which we would uh, commend to you, and in relation in particular to uh, the principles relating to secondary legislation. That's the first point. This is really secondary legislation, is it? Well, uh, my lady, we submit that it is. And uh, can I just walk the court through our understanding of the process by which these rules were promulgated? The PRA makes rules pursuant to section 138G of FISMA. Now, I understand you have a bundle uh, which deals with these particular additional it's a new one, is it? So the first point to make is that the PRA, as I said, makes rules pursuant to section 138G of FISMA in rulemaking instruments. And we see that section itself. The 
second point is that the relevant rulemaking instrument here is the Policyholder Protection Instrument 2015, which was made by order of the Board of the PRA in the exercise of its powers under FISMA 2000. Where do we find that? Is that tab That's, three? That, that is behind tab three. should note, really, that this, the Policyholder Protection Instrument, is the, um, is the unfriendly version of the PPR. Is the, sorry, the... Is the unfriendly version of the PPR. The Policyholder Protection Rules, uh, as they appear in the authorities bundle, and combines all of the extant rule instruments to create a readable view of the rule book. That much we are told by the PRA itself on its website, and you can see that behind tab one of the bundle, on what is page three, under the middle of the page, what are legal instruments. which I asked the court to read. Can I just be clear? When you say that the, the definitive rules, which are referred to there, are they what are set out in full behind tab three? Yes. Because that, on a quick look, that does seem to include the italicisation, which is quite helpful in picking up the fine terms. Y yes. So well, when you say they're unfriendly, I'm not quite sure how unfriendly they are. Um, in, in particular, looking at, because it's highly relevant, 3.112, doesn't italicise the first reference to claim, which I think it's common ground yes. is not supposed to be the defined term. So yes, well, I imagine the the PPR, as we've been relying upon it, uh, it emboldens the defined terms in the same way that it's right. italicised. So what, what I'm the point I'm making, I suppose, is simply that if this is the definitive instrument, perhaps it is. It is potentially of relevance to look at what. It chooses to put in italic. Yes. 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 With respect, but I think the pin has exactly right. But, but there are subsequent instruments. Yes. Which amend this. This is this isn't the definitive one, is it? Because we haven't, for example, got the 100% change no. in, in this one. Um, but uh, is what we're being told on page three in your submission that what appears on the website is the up-to-date version of, of which reflects the various instruments that have amended the rule book. I, I understand that to be so. That, that appears to be what's being mm. said. It looks as though it also has a link to the, yes, the actual link. legal instrument. Thank you. So following from that, we say that the rules are, are indeed and Sorry, you say they are rules. Yes. Within the meaning of that term and the interpretation. Yes. And are accordingly governed by the general principles of statutory interpretation. Now, the reference in the interpretation <coughs> act is section twenty-one, which defines subordinate legislation to mean orders in council, orders, rules, regulations, etc., and other instruments made by or to be made under any act. Um, if that's right, that simply means that the, the specific provisions in the Interpretation Act apply. I don't think the Act sets out general principles. 
No. Of interpretation. No, but can I take you then to what uh, Ben? Yeah. I don't think this has made its way up to you, but we shall cure that. Right. These extracts from Benyon and from Craig's, uh, which we've provided to my learned friend, but I don't think they've come up to you. My apologies for that. Can I just give you references for the moment? Benyon at 3.3 uses the phrase delegated legislation to include orders in council, regulations, orders and rules. same effect according to praise on legislation at 1.1.8. The rules were, of course, made pursuant to FISMA. Just pause for a moment while they're do uh, rely on the Barris principle and on the Barris presumption. And we do so with the additional unusual feature of this case in that the scheme, the FSCS, is a party to these proceedings and was, of course, of course a party to geologistics. That is normally not the case. But here we say it adds rather than detracts to the application of the principle. And the use once again by the FSCS of the very words that were at the heart of the dispute in now, we set out our reliance on the Barris principle in paragraphs 19 and following in our skeleton. There's no need, I don't think, for me to say any more than that. And uh, the court has been taken to the uh, extract in Benyon in relation to the Barris principle. It is a principle of high authority. Uh, whether it rises to the level of a presumption or something, something to be debated and something for the court. Uh, but it has the recent uh, imprimatur of uh, the Supreme Court, and, uh, which is 
set forth in the, in the uh, Shrek Compendium. So we would commend uh, those materials to the court, and we do, as I say, rely on that principle in the context of this proceeding. Whilst I'm on the statutory framework, and I, my little friend has taken you quite fairly through the particular provisions. I'd like to add, if I may, References to section 22 of BISMA, which is a tab 8A of the authorities. Which identifies regulated activities for the purposes of FISMA. <coughs> and it says at section 22, an activity is a regulated activity for the purposes of this Act if it is an activity of a specified kind, which is carried on by way of business and uh, A and B relates to an investment of a specified kind or B in the case of an activity of a kind which is also specified the purposes of this paragraph is carried on in relation to property of any kind. Now, underneath section 22 is uh, the regulated activities order, and the court will find that behind tab 12A of the authorities. And in particular, section 10. which specifies, pursuant to section 22, the regulated activities in respect of insurance. And they are, as per section 10, affecting a contract of insurance as principal, as a specified kind of activity, and two, carrying out a contract of insurance as principal, as a specified kind of activity. So one can take from affecting and or carrying out a contract of insurance as principal is a specified and regulated activity. Now, we say that's important uh, because we say that that is the bright line divide here between regulated activities and unregulated court should not lose sight with respect of that bright line divide. Now, with those uh, matters in hand, can I turn to our submissions on the three ways that we in the court below and in this court put our case on behalf of our client. The first, and the reference here to our skeleton, is to uh, paragraphs 22 and following. The first way we put the case is to say that the respondent's application for unpaid legal costs and interests is an application in respect of a protected claim and thus within the qualifying conditions set forth in Rule 3.1. That was our ground one before the court below and it's called issue one in our skeleton. The second way we put the case, this is at paragraphs 51 and following, 
is that we submit that the insured's application, the respondent's application for unpaid legal costs and interest, is in and of itself a protected claim. And thus, once again, <coughs> within the qualifying conditions in, three, in Rule 3.1. The third way that we put the claim on behalf of the respondents is at paragraph 63 and following the Harvard skeleton. And in this context, we submit that our application for compensation for unpaid legal costs and interest is a protected claim because it is a valid claim for a civil liability under a protected contract of insurance and thus within Rule 3.1 uh, qualifying conditions. That was our ground three before we then adjudged and our issue three in the skeleton. Now, the learned judge was with us in relation to the first ground but against us in relation to ground we say, in relation to the first ground, that in his careful judgment, the judge was right about that. And insofar as it matters, we say in relation to the alternative ground, that he uh, was wrong. Now, the starting point, of course, is uh, Rule 3.1. But as soon as I say that, it's important to understand the definition of protected claim before we go anywhere else. Now, it may be easier for the court to follow what I say, but certainly <coughs> I find it difficult to keep track unless it's written in front of me. To follow paragraph 51 of our skeleton argument lays out in terms the steps that I'm about to take. It's not, <coughs> doesn't take us very far to refer to a definition of protected claim in a glossary. A protected claim is defined in Rule 9 as a claim you might please turn this up. And if the court has a copy where the defined terms are emboldened, it may make it easier to follow. Rule 9.1, a protected claim, that being a defined term, is a claim, that being a defined term, under a protected contract of insurance. So looking then at the definition of claim, a claim is defined in Rule 1.2 on page 193 of the Hundu to mean a valid claim made in respect of a civil liability owed by a relevant person under a contract of insurance. And a protected contract of insurance, second part of the definition, is defined also in Rule 1.2 at page 197 to mean a contract of insurance which is covered by the policyholder protection scheme as defined in 9.2. Now it's common ground here that the policy was a protected contract of insurance. So that need not trouble us. It 
follows in our submission that the definition of a protected claim, once you insert the definition of claim into the definition of protected claim, reads as follows. A valid claim made in respect of a civil liability owed by a relevant person under a contract of insurance under a protected contract of insurance. Now, it is obvious, we submit, that that is intended to say when one removes the duplication, it is intended to define a protected claim as a valid claim made in respect of a civil liability owed by a relevant person under a protected contract of insurance. Now, the FSCS doesn't embrace, oddly, that definition, but it seems to us that it can't be anything else. The liability has to be owed under the protected contract of insurance. The liability... The liability of the relevant person... Yes. The civil liability has to be a civil liability arising under a protected contract of insurance. Yes, but for the word arising, that's right, Your Honour. In respect of a civil liability owed under a contract, a protected contract of insurance. Yes. We, of course, focus upon the words in that definition, in respect of. So we say that the natural and ordinary meaning of those words, in respect of, as they appear in the definition of claim, speak to something else, something more than simply a civil liability, as Your Ladyship says, arising under a contract of insurance. Sorry, don't follow that. We say, my lady, that a valid claim, and repeating the definition... If you read the words into the definition, as you've just done... Yes. So a protected claim is a valid claim... Yes. ...made in respect of a civil liability, yes? Yes. ...owed by a relevant person, i.e. an insurer, under a protected contract of insurance. Yes. Yes, right? Well, in respect of a civil liability... ...can't mean anything other than what it means, which is it's got to relate to a civil liability owed by somebody under a protected contract of insurance. We say that the words in respect of there mean what they ordinarily mean, which is made in connection with a civil liability owed under a protected contract of insurance. We say not simply that it has to be a protected claim under a protected contract of insurance. I'm sorry, I've tripped over myself. We say it doesn't have to be simply... So you're saying that the words in respect of mean in connection with a civil liability. Correct. So if there is a civil liability owed by a relevant person under a protected contract of insurance, i.e. a liability to pay the policy sum... Yes, ma'am. ...you say the definition encompasses a claim made in respect of that liability to pay the protected sum, which would include a liability to pay costs and interest. Precisely so, Your Honour. Got it. And can I just, if I'm clear, the definition of claim here is claim against the insurer, which is a defined term. Yes, claim of a relevant person. Yes. By what criteria do you decide whether that is or isn't a valid claim if it isn't a claim which is covered by the insurer? If it doesn't, as you say, have to be a claim under the contract of insurance, a claim that's covered on the insurance, how do you decide whether or not it's a valid claim? I 
don't have a clever or immediate answer for that, my dear. I don't know what was intended uh, by the rules by inserting the word valid here, uh, other than to obviously hive off claims that would be invalid. That wouldn't make us any proud. No. I mean, the, the point against you is valid clearly, therefore, looks to whether it is a claim which is valid under the terms of the contract of insurance. Possibly, but, possibly, but, but not necessarily. But do you have no alternative in this year? Not, not at the moment, but I should think. We would, we would say that a claim, we would say that a claim for legal costs and interest <coughs> incurred in pursuing a defaulting insurer is a valid claim and not an invalid claim. On any view. Valid in law. Valid in law for no other reason than it's, been a, it, it, it's pursuant to an order, uh, pursuant to judgments and orders of this court. So there can be no question as to the validity of it. We don't accept Lord Justice as possible would point, that it must be limited simply to validity according to the terms of the contract of insurance. If it meant that, it would have said that. Indeed, that, that is a theme throughout. My learned friend insists that really what the scheme is designed to do is to protect an insured in the event that an insurer collapses. Now, there is no, ca no cavil with that. Is the principal purpose of the scheme. That's precisely what the scheme is designed to do. But it's not to say that it doesn't also cover matters incidental to that principal purpose, and that's what we say. Well, why do you have to go that far? Uh, on, on, on your case, if the insurer goes bust, um, he's, he's also leaving the assured in the lurch in terms of the cost of pursuing him. Precisely so, Madam. And that's uh, <coughs> that's one of the black holes with which we're concerned. If, if, if taking it at, at its highest, if my learned friend is really right that the compensation payable under this scheme is limited to the contractual insurance indemnity, then our first submission is it would have said so. It had myriad opportunity to say so throughout the rule and hasn't and doesn't. The second point is that the FSCS has to be taken to be fully aware of the decision in geologistics and what the court and this court said about the proper meaning in the predecessor scheme. In respect to. And third, if my learned friend is right, if the scheme is right in relation to the narrow application of the scheme, then it's no answer for people in the position of my client. And it's with respect no answer at all to tell them that they can run off and JR the FSC is if they don't get a decision as to what's properly within the contract. It seems to be have a distinct air of unreality about it, number one. And number two, the other black hole, of course, is that clients in my client, uh, insureds in my client's position, are simply left holding the can for costs and interest of pursuing a recalcitrant, contract-breaking insurer. Now, Mr. Justice Davis in Geologistics talked about fairness. And if the court goes back to see what it said there about it, the same point applies here. That cannot be regarded as a fair result in relation to this scheme especially in circumstances where the 
PLA has gone out of its way to elevate the compensation payable to building guarantee policyholders from 90% to 100% on an urgent basis without public consultation. It's simply, we would suggest that it's inconsistent with, we're not saying that the policy statement said that there'd be full recovery. We don't put it so high. But we don't have to put it so high. We are saying that the rules, as drafted, provide for compensation payable to our clients in respect of the matters which are unpaid, simply on the natural and ordinary meaning of the qualifying conditions in Rule 3. Now, can I go to Rule 3? This provides that the FSCS may, uh, in the court below, it was accepted by Mr. Cutlass that may actually means must in those circumstances, but I think in later provisions in the rules. A compensation if the qualifying conditions set forth in the rule are met. Now, the qualifying conditions in Rule 3.1 are, first, the application uh, is made by an eligible claimant. And that is a defined term. There's no issue here at all in relation to whether my clients are eligible to claim or not. It is accepted by the FSCS that they are eligible claims. So that qualifying condition is met. Okay. The second qualifying condition is that the claim there used to mean the application in in 3.122, the first use of the word claim is common ground that it means not claim as defined but application, is in respect of a protected claim, a defined term, against a relevant person, a defined term, who is in the fog. Now, once again, it's common ground that East West was a relevant person in default. It's common ground that the Zurich policy was a protected contract of insurance. And it's common ground that the respondent's claim on the Zurich policy was a protected claim. So the debate before the learned judge therefore focused on whether the insured's application for compensation was in respect of that protected claim. If you're right about the meaning of a valid claim, you don't need the word in respect of again, do you? Because you, you say the, the, the application is in respect of a protected claim the application is in respect of a valid claim for a civil liability owed under a contract of insurance by a relevant person. Under a protected contract of insurance. Sorry, sorry, my lady. Well, you, you've just been addressing us on the meaning of protected claim. Yeah. Reading all the words into that. And you said protected claim is wide enough to cover something in respect of a civil liability yeah. owed under a protected contract of insurance. So, if that is right, and the words protected claim are wide enough to encompass a claim for costs and interest, 
then subparagraph 2, the claims in respect of a protected claim, you don't need the words in respect of, because it's, it's in respect of a protected claim, whichever way you read in respect of. Yes, with respect, my lady, precisely so. So that uh, is the grounds 1 and 2 in all uh, in alternative. In a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. But so if, you're, if you're right on ground 2, then in 3.12, the expression in respect of is superfluous and tautology. Yeah, it, it means something different. Yeah, if, if you're right on ground one. Yeah. Now, I, I was going to turn to ge geologistics, but it uh, would now be an appropriate time before I... Yes, that's probably a convenient moment. But five to two. All right,